Just set your iPhone calendars or your diaries to April the 12th. Um, and just to, to also say, uh, we're all social, me social media up tonight. Um, there's several things you can um, put rude comments on the COSA hashtag. That's hashtag you are. You can go to your Facebook application on your iPhone and uh, check in to the Arts Catalyst as a place. And you can also text your friends who didn't make it tonight and tell them that we will be live streaming this event. Um, so you can look on the Arts Catalyst website. Okay, now last time we said that we, we, we would be charging you for this uh, next event. Um, that's not the case, it's free. <laughs> but, and it will be for the, for the next, uh, and for the next uh, um, uh, Cosmica, Yuri's Night. However, you may notice we have, in the name of um, income generation, we have put the drinks up. So I'm, I'm sorry about that, um, but we just have to think of all those, all those uh, bankers whose bonuses we have to pay with the forthcoming arts cuts. And I hope to see you all on the march on Saturday. Okay, one more thing I have to mention. Those of you who know a little bit about the Arts Catalyst may know that uh, we worked with an extraordinary artist called James Acord who was the first and only artist ever to have a license to handle radioactive materials. We think it's, he was all for transparency in the nuclear world. We're having a special night to commemorate him next Tuesday. So that's Tuesday. Check our website. So there's another event, not a cosmic event, but a very special event to commemorate uh, James A. Acord on Tuesday. So two dates for your diary, James A. Acord on Tuesday and April the 12th, Yuri's night, and I expect to see you all there. Okay, thanks very much for coming. I'm going to hand over now to Nao Mantra, the organizer of this evening, who's going to tell you something about what you should be expecting. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, well, thanks to the Arts Catalyst for making this happen again. Um, well, the, the, the idea of this series is just to, to, to get together all the, all the people that are interested in exploring space from a, from a different angle or point of view. And in, in the first one, we, 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 we try to keep the program as, as varied and dynamic as, as much as possible. And this evening, I'm very excited because we have we have some really, really special guests uh, with us. Two of them are coming from, from Germany. Um, and we have a really nice performance. So the, the, the whole idea of the evening is, is the following. We, we have uh, the ladies of Thin Fingers over there. So every time that we have a break tonight, uh, they are going to, 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 to be doing a one-to-one -one show, 25 minutes, and they are going to take you into space is, is one to one so I think you'll have to queue. So the, <laughs> yeah. So um, and then well we 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 we're going to start with uh, Agnes Mayers. She well her works uh, is is about weightlessness, microgravity and uh, migrations. Uh, that's the first thing that we're going to have. Then uh, we're going to have a break like for 30 minutes, so you can go to the, to the, to the toilets, and to the bar, and to the one-to-one -one show. And then we're going to have a We Colonize the Moon with Sue and Hagen. And they're going to talk about their, 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 their experiences working in, 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 in this project. So uh, I don't want to give uh, too much information about the program, because they're going to see it yourselves. Just a couple of notes is, if you want to go to the toilet, very important, you just have to go through those doors and go down, and it's that you, you, you'll see it in front of you. And second thing, health and safety, is if the fire alarm goes off, um, there are two options. <laughs> Either we have to go down, but if the fire is down, we have to go up. So <laughs> we, we, we will let you know. That's it. <laughs>
Okay, hello. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm very glad to be here tonight and also to see you, so many. And yeah, tonight I talk about space traveling. And I will present three or maybe four methods uh, of space traveling. And before, just some words about uh, my work in general. As an artist, I'm working at the experimental edge between art science and new technologies, exploring the zone between fact and fiction. And in 2003, I founded uh, the Research Trust for Chateauraine Ecology, which is a small institute, uh, mainly focusing in the exploration of subterranean phenomena. Here you see me on our first raft on a subterranean lake in Cologne. But subterranean phenomena such as microscale universe inside stone or earth cores, or a subterranean ice cores, uh, subterranean ice, everything is ice skating rings in cooperation <laughs> with NASA. And um, yeah, here you see the top, that's a view into the depth, into the borehole. And I developed tools, tools to search. And with the help of these tools, uh, the visitor, during or public field tests, the visitor is able to perform a type of field test into these hidden worlds. And, um, yeah. Since three years, I'm uh, not only exploring subterranean spaces and phenomena, but also I went into the other direction. Not only very deep down, but also very high up. Uh, very heavy and very light, and uh, inside Earth, outside Earth, and also comparing the parallels between these tools. Um, yeah, and here you see an overview of the tools we developed so far. Earth Collaborator X and blah, blah, blah. And uh, yeah, in order to realize well-functioning tools, uh, we work together in teams, depending on research focus and project, the teams consist of experimental computer scientists, biologists, hydrogeologists, geophysicians. It, it's really, yeah, it depends really on the project and its focus. And we are probing um, unknown terms, the unknown. And it's a poetic approach to the unknown. Okay, now let's go to the first space traveler. A fascinating visitor from space is a, hello, you feel right? Uh, meteorites are actually, besides some uh, samples, Apollo moon samples and from Stardust missions, we are the only extraterrestrial uh, material uh, mankind can handle here. And meteorites, they look like stones, very normal, but they contain cosmic material, material created under non-terrestrial circumstances, material which doesn't exist here on Earth, Except maybe in the inner core of the Earth. Um, and some meteorites are very, very heavy, created by, by heat and the millions and millions of years of traveling through outer space, uh, have very dense material. And some meteor uh, meteorites are very, very light, and they have contain voice with encapsulated atmosphere from outer space, or pockets with preserved uh, weightlessness from outer space. And uh, yeah, my research, or my, my interest in meteorites started in Siberia. I, I had a working stay there in Ekaterinburg. It's a city in West Siberia. And one street attracted my special attention. And this was here in the middle of the city, I'm in Siberia. And there you could see uh, an institute of mineral, a mineral museum also. And on the other side of the city, the Federal Agency of Cosmos. So one was investigating the earthly matter, and one was looking in higher realities or in higher altitudes. And of course, for my interest, that was really interesting. And I thought, why are these two institutes here in one street? Do they have any common um, yeah, research focus, any common project, or is it just a sheer coincidence? And yeah, I was... Uh, asking myself, and then I couldn't help but had to draw the conclusion that maybe once a meteorite landed here in that street, 
And one institute was investigating the earthly matters and the other the cosmic matters of that uh, meteorite. And then I started to follow this hypothesis. So I was looking for some proof, maybe some signs of a crater in the street or so. And I went also to the geophysical laboratory or institute there to, to look if um, uh, some seismic activity had recorded in earlier times which could have been caused by a meteorite impact and so on. But that's actually the starting point of my uh, meteorite research. And um, since then I'm researching the possibility how to calculate the trajectory or how to predict and forecast the meteorite fall. And yeah, I, I show you some uh, research I did here recalculating in at the barrier major crater. Can you make me down a little bit higher? Thank you. Представляете, что человечество допустило величайшую промашку в своей истории. There is a, a famous group at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in uh, Pasadena, or Los Angeles, who specialize in calculating a near-Earth object. Of course, only the big ones, because they are more dangerous to Earth, and, and they are also more easy to, to detect. But uh, I visited them, and I show you that that's their um, trailer. When we're at her, I'm going to take a look at the ground. Hmm. My guess is that this body is in the hot. You have a sign? Got to be in the 300 meter range. What's going on? Hmm. Hmm.
Yeah, that, so, so these guys are sitting uh, at the GPL in Pasadena, and I met Steve Chesley, one of uh, that group, and uh, yeah, he, he told me that actually the first uh, predicted meteorite fall, they, they put uh, forecast, and it was in October 2008. And uh, yeah, they really for, uh, predicted the place, the time. It was a meteorite in uh, Sudan. Here's meteor predicted to hit Earth's atmosphere tonight. Meteor explodes over Sudan, right on schedule. And yes, uh, Steve told me how it was uh, that that uh, reef station, and they calculated it, and it really in it, it happened like they had calculated, and I was so happy about it because that was the first proof that their systems, their calculation systems, were working. Anyway, a uh, lot of uh, intense uh, investigation made us uh, the following projection that there is another meteorite fall or impact happening in Belgium. November last year, 2010, November the 20th. And it was also of minor size, so no human damage uh, was expected. And so we were hoping to witness a meteorite impact in situ. And, and we, yeah, we took the chance and to organize a public meteorite watching event. Uh, in cooperation with the community of Herzl, that's uh, the town where we expected the meteorite to land. And yeah, we were hoping to, to, yeah, to see a meteorite landing. And the mayor of Herzl, some days before the calculated impact, he was cooking for his community. And we went there when he was cooking and we were asking him about the Bent u op de hoogte? Ik heb dat inderdaad ook gehoord, ja. Dat klopt. Hoe ernstig moeten we dat bericht nemen? Wat u bedoelt, hoe ernstig moet u het bericht nemen? In elk geval, het klopt, het is in elk geval juist. Men heeft daar wetenschappelijk alle inlichtingen over ingewonnen. En het is inderdaad zo dat hij zal neerstuiken of neervallen, of hoe ik het ook mag noemen, in Herzele, hier bij ons in Herzele. Ja, dat klopt, ja. Is er dan geen gevaar voor de inwoners van Herzele? Absoluut niet. Uh, wij, kunnen, uh, wij zijn op alles voorbereid, we zijn paraat. Uh, er is een veiligheidscel geweest, politie, brandweer uh, zijn ingelicht en hebben daarover vergaderd. En men heeft mij laten weten dat er absoluut geen problemen zouden zijn voor de inwoners van haar zee. Ja, ik heb nu een video van de impact night. Keep your mouth and ears open 
don't wear earplugs. This helps your body to compensate the intense air pressure wave a meteorite impact might cause. 4. Always stay behind the safety line. Don't enter the inner circle. 5. In case of an emergency, please follow further instructions of the crew. 6. Stay calm. Don't run. Walk slowly. 7. Look for shelter and cover your head. 8. Cover yourself before you care for your neighbor. 9. Follow the evacuation instructions of our crew. 10. Please don't worry. Our crew is prepared to act accordingly. Thank you. Dus dat is een fusion thrust. Dus wanneer dat zo'n meteoriet door de atmosfeer beweegt, gaat hij eigenlijk aan de buitenzijde van de atmosfeer. Attention, for your information. Meteorite impact is estimated in 10 minutes. Ancient times, most observers saw the stars as a sphere. Hey, you come down for us. Hey, Mazirce, there comes the damp out. Yeah, that's it. There must be some sort of. But, uh, is that his name in your heart? Before that the two of the earth were made of stars. Voordat de maan naar de baan niet is, is het niet typisch een kosten, zegt dat. We hebben al drie exemplaren. Is de krater goed? Voordat de maan verdwijnt helemaal. Eerst de ijzeren zakwekkende stilte en vol slaten duisteren. Ja, we hebben nog iets gevonden. Would they be made of? 
in the vast Milky Way galaxy, how come is what we call life. Yeah, after that, I mean, here you see the creator which was created. And we, after that, there was a public meteorite scanning session and so on. But I will um, go on. In uh, last year, in, in March, I had the pleasure to um, research at UCLA in uh, Los Angeles at, at NASA, and I was uh, investigating um, moon rocks. And, and other stones also from outer space. But when I went to UCLA, I, I talked with several scientists and I found out that all these scientists who investigate these uh, samples from, from the Apollo missions, they have to keep their samples very safe in a safe or in a security container. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's the rule. So when you walk uh, through the university, you can find here behind the door or below the table, you can find everywhere a tiny uh, security container um, containing some uh, moon rocks. And actually I found out that place on Earth with the highest density of moon, or the most moon on Earth, is this university. <laughs> if you think about the university without building. And here's uh, some sails or some... Open the sails. It's not very convenient, as you see. <laughs> the best side. So I'll hide the combination for a moment. So, here we have things. And as I said, most of it's not that interesting. Actually, this one is interesting. <laughs> this is probably the most interesting room that we have. It's not belonging to me, in fact. This is the only one that's more white. So that is the color. Yeah, the moon is a gray place. The moon is, is mostly gray. Don't you know? Now, there are some white rocks on the moon. Studied years ago. I'm not sure how much was left. Can't call. Might not be much. They don't give us big pieces. Oh gosh. have a view onto it under a microscope, <laughs> or I could just release it here. <laughs> so this lunar sample is so small that it's not affected by the Earth's gravity. It doesn't fall off, it doesn't fall down. So the Earth's captain says it's only lunar satellite. <laughs> here. 
Okay, from this uh, to other tiny particles hovering in the air, or floating in air, I want to talk about the next space traveler, the cloud cores. And they are actually only aeronauts, because to be an astronaut you must fly higher than 100 kilometers. But to investigate uh, cloud cores, you have to float in air yourself. And uh, some years ago I had the possibility to uh, participate in a scientific flight with the German Aerospace Agency. And uh, surrounded by scientists uh, doing their experiment, I realized uh, an artistic experiment in order to study cloud cores. There must be large supplies of visible water in the air. Where does this invisible water come from? But most of the satellites in orbit the Earth will be at the top of the cloud. Can you tell us where the top of the cloud is? And of course, in the bottom, because we can see the bottom of the cloud, we don't know what's in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, what is a cloud core actually? Uh, cloud cores are also called aerosols and, and water in the air. No matter how humid it is, it needs these tiny, tiny particles to join onto, to condensate around. And only when there are these cloud cores uh, exist, clouds can form. So they are the basis for cloud formation. And um, yeah, well, many drops form a cloud. So here's one cloud core from outside I will show you. This is recorded in uh, microgravity. <laughs> yeah, and um, under terrestrial gravity, it's very hard to uh, to study these cloud cores. I mean, they just fall down too speedy down to us. And so, uh, in microgravity or zero gravity, you can hold the scanner in front of the core and investigate it and then bring all the data to the machines and so on. But this method, of course, uh, needs that you, have, that you work in weightlessness. And uh, yeah, so did I then, with the German Aerospace Agency, and here you see the that's my uh, lab steer. Inside that, I conducted a whole series of tests with different dropper tools in order to probe the nuclei. And that's, uh, you see only half, that's the um, cloud core visualization wheel. And yeah, when you walk to, through the airplane, there were all these different experiments, and they all had their control room for output. So when you were walking through, you could see on that control monitor output uh, some numbers, on the other control monitor output some current here. Whereas I had also four control monitors with real-time output here and, and there. For example, you could see, that's one inside of a cloud core, you could see, depending on gravity status, a water castle swimming on water or in zero gravity, a water castle swimming on air. And uh, this is just a video still, everything is uh, recorded. And first flight day I investigated nine cloud cores by 31 parabolas by three flight days. So it's, uh, I brought back a lot of data. And yeah, I don't go more into the project now, it's very complex. Uh, it would fill a talk by itself. I just so show you now the earthly version, or the version for ter terrestrial conditions. That's a flight net, again the same which was on the airplane. And during an uh, exhibition, I investigate cloud cores of the exhibition space. This is a cloud machine, and so on. It's at the moment on display in, uh, in Den Haag. But as I said, I want to keep this project very briefly, it's too complex. I just show you some uh, scenes uh, where I was working in weightlessness. These are some hectic uh, preparations before the next parabola starting, the next double G phase. Thank uh -huh. 
good. We're in a two phase. Yeah. Facility, it's more or less a garage in Miami. 
that's a new one, which is a little bit more aerodynamic, so it gets a, it's a, gets a shell, unfortunately. From this uh, assembly facility, I went uh, to another one from NASA. I also went there. There, there are uh, it's cleaner conditions where they are at the morning make a, uh, they test the new Mars rover, which will be set up in 2012, and they turn him around. And now to some other um, private space uh, activists, not not as good as NASA, uh, as uh, Mars and Space System, but also from that launch day, they they wanted to test the blue ball, what it was called. They have also white suits like like a GPL, but it's not clean. <laughs> Zombie flying up 450 feet high, they also wanted to do. But they are very good and ambitious, but they had a little bit bad luck and uh, it uh, didn't go so well. <laughs> Here you see the experiment set up, chair, harness, moongies, all uh, 
instruments you would need for a possible takeoff. And yeah, I wanted to in, to observe if movies are uh, especially sensitive to this cosmic phenomena, such as total solar eclipse. Maybe will they go uh, into flight formation? Will they maybe even head towards the moon? Or yeah, how how, how will uh, total solar eclipse influence their migration behavior? The expedition started in Helsinki, and we drove my train down to Novosibirsk, like five days. And uh, finding moongis in Siberia uh, wasn't easy at all, especially as these birds are spending so much time traveling between the Earth and the moon. But thanks to some uh, lo to two local experts, we were able to launch experiments with 30 moongis. And seven of these moongis came uh, uh, 400 kilometers north of Novosibirsk from a small town, there you see. And the other six moongis came from uh, Sasha and Gennady Deriba in Akademik Borodok, that's uh, part of Novosibirsk. And that's uh, their home. That's Sasha. And here you see me becoming familiar with the moongu. And uh, that's their kitchen. It's a very special uh, place on Earth. They live in a self-constructed house from uh, recycled material. And they live also together with the animals. They have not only kids, as you see. And in the, it's also good, like uh, Sasha told me, that in winter, and the winter in Siberia takes six months, they don't need to go outside to feed the animals. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, here you see uh, me testing and measuring the bees for preparing the harnesses. And up there, that was my model in, uh, in Germany to prepare the bees harnesses. <laughs> so the, the experiment took place in the river Ob on a small island, 60 kilometers south of Nordmutterberg. That was the island called Sacred Skara, and uh, Sacred Skara is an old, comes from old Egypt mythology, and it's also a sun goddess which, is, uh, which can roll the sun along the horizon. But we, I choose the island because, uh, according to the weather forecast, there was a cloud-free sky expected, so uh, I, we were hoping to have the most strong influence of the eclipse, and yeah, I will better show some video footage of the day of the experiment. Now that's the moon we saw my life.
A mi me exposa molt, eh? Sí, però bueno, ho hi deixo ja. 28, 29, 30... Well, uh, thank you, uh, Agnes. Uh, we're going to have a, a break, uh, approximately, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, so feel free to go to the bar, and, and Team Fingers, they'll be doing more space.